Okay, is everybody happy to start? Well, my name is Wayne David. I'm the uh, uh, Member of Parliament for Kafili and the Shadow Minister for the Middle East and North Africa. And I've been asked to chair this uh, important uh, seminar. Now, the Foreign Policy Centre has been organising with uh, CIPAD, which is the Sectarianism, Proxies and Desectorialization Project at the Richardson Institute for Peace at Lancaster University. They've been organising a series of virtual public seminars focused on peace building in Lebanon, Bosnia, Syria and Yemen. And uh, this evening we have the, the final seminar focusing on uh, Yemen and the seminar will examine the complex relationships uh, between peace building, power sharing and sectarian identities in Yemen today. The seminar will explore ideas around possible power sharing agreements for Yemen, what they would mean for the different political actors, and what it might deliver for the country's politics, security, and perhaps in, most importantly of all, what it could deliver for the well being of its people. The seminar will run for an hour and a half. We've got four contributors who will begin our deliberations. And uh, the four speakers consisting of the panel are Professor Simon Mabon, Director of the CPER uh, project, uh, Dadwa Al Dosari, non resident scholar at the Middle East Institute, uh, Meza Shuja Al Din, who is the non resident fellow at the Asanan Project. Uh, Center for Strategic Studies, and Kate Newens, who is the non-resident consultant with the Yemen Policy Center. There, there'll be plenty of opportunity for the, the large number of participants which we have today to uh, ask questions, and uh, I will do my best to, to, to regiment them and have them in some sort of order. So if you'd like to submit them to the, uh, uh, the, the Q&A box, and then I will do my best to uh, put them to our speakers. But to begin the event, our, our first contributor is Professor Simon Mabon, who is director of the CPAD uh, project. Professor Mabon. Thank you very much for the, uh, the kind words and the introduction. Uh, before I start, I just wanted to say a, a huge thank you to Adam Poppy and the whole team at the Foreign Policy Center for all of their, their efforts pulling together this series of events. It's very much appreciated. And, and we at CEPAD really couldn't wish for a, a better uh, collaborator in terms of putting all these things together. So Adam Poppy, thank you so much for all of your efforts. I just wanted to, uh, to put that out there. And a, a huge thank you to, to everyone for attending. It's wonderful to, to be here with, with some scholars and and people whose work I greatly admire. So um, I'm really looking forward to, to hearing what other people have to say rather than me. Um, what I will do to start with though, is, is maybe just put some flesh on the bones of, of ideas of power sharing broadly and um, maybe sketch out the bigger picture of, of recent developments in Yemen. Uh, and then I'm sure that uh, that my colleagues have got some more um, more detailed, more nuanced information, details to and to really elaborate on some of these broader points. But I thought it's useful, given that the series of, of events that we've been reflecting on, um, looking at Syria, looking at Lebanon, uh, Bosnia, and now Yemen has been on power sharing as a means of of building peace. I thought it was useful just to actually reflect about. What, what power sharing is all about. And fundamentally, it's this idea of bringing groups together, groups that have had, um, had their differences, often violent, often resulting in conflict, bringing them together and using political systems as a means of addressing those issues. There's a whole host of different approaches to understanding power sharing from the corporate to the liberal. But within these different understandings, there are a number of of fundamental principles, namely the idea of a grand coalition bringing together disparate groups that have often been in conflict with one another. 
Second, it contains a minority veto to try and ensure that any of the, the approaches, policies, processes deployed by this grand coalition don't unduly target particular communities. Third, it has a form of proportional representation as a means of trying to accurately reflect the, the population dynamics, the demographics of a particular community. And, and finally, there's this sense of autonomy, this, this regional autonomy that seeks to map on to the, um, map on to the, the, the local demographics, the, the geography of what's happening and, and to provide some form in, in a range of different ways, of course, of, um, of autonomy. So that's the, the broad sort of sketching and in theory, there's a lot to like about power sharing, but as, as previous events have shown, there are a number of, um, of very serious issues that crop up when we actually try and put it into practice. And uh, one of the, the other events featured the work of John Nagel, whose wonderful turn of phrase, zombie power sharing, sets up some of the, the real issues with regard to the failings of power sharing to actually move beyond this idea of building fences between different communal groups. But that, in the case of Yemen, is a problem that's quite a way down the line. In the case of Yemen, the idea of power sharing seeks to bring together these disparate groups that have been engaged in a conflict uh, that's, that's cost tens, if not hundreds of thousands of lives and left Yemen on the brink of uh, the, the world's most devastating humanitarian crisis, as some reports have labeled it. So, the idea of power sharing then seems to be quite an important approach. It seems to offer a great deal of hope to those wanting to address the various grievances of the disparate groups involved in the Yemen conflict. But if we're going to even, even think about this, if we're thinking about power sharing, there are a number of immediate questions that crop up. I mean, who's sharing the power, for one? Who is it that we're actually talking about when we're talking about creating this grand coalition? Is it? The, the officially recognized government and the Houthis? Is it the officially recognized government and the Southern Transitional Council? Is it the Southern Transitional Council or the STC and the Houthis? The STC and uh, the Ayla party? Is it the different sectarian groups? Is it the different local authorities? Is it the different tribes? Is it the different political parties? Is it the various civil society movements that are operating across Yemen? Who is it that we should actually be including in these discussions about a grand coalition? The, broadly speaking, there's, there's five main areas that have emerged in Yemen controlled by these different groups, the Houthis, the government, the STC, the Joint Resistance Forces, and then local authorities. And underpinning that, there's 333 different local governorates, different tribal groups, different political parties, different civil society movements. So how we actually get to a point where there is conflict to a broader power sharing agreement between these different groups seems to be incredibly, um, incredibly challenging. We've also then got other types of issues, practical issues over the apparent absence of a state. The Yemeni state has been um, declared missing in, missing in action by some. It's failed to take care of its people. It's seemingly fragmented under the various pressures from above and below, struggling to actually meet the basic needs of its own people. Of course, regional actors have a huge role to play here. They've exerted a great deal of influence, the likes of Saudi Arabia, Iran, the UAE, the US and the UK. So that in turn puts a great deal of pressure on these different actors themselves because of their transnational, international relationships. So there's a whole host of different pressures starting to emerge here. And these are exacerbated by economic factors, political tensions, territorial tensions, religious tensions. And that point about religion really comes to the fore with the construction of sect-based divisions, the sectarianization of the conflict, the, the bringing to the fore of sectarianism and sect-based tensions between different groups as a real driving force in the conflict which wasn't necessarily there before. Whilst religious identities and sect-based difference was a prominent feature of Yemeni life, it wasn't the driving force of the conflict, but now it's taken on uh, an incredibly important role. And once that sectarian genie is out of the proverbial bottle, then it's difficult to get it back in. 
once sectarianization has taken place, it's difficult to desectarianize. That's something that, that we in SEPAD are trying to look at, the various processes that can be applied to facilitate a form of desectarianization. So you've got all of these different things going on. You've got the United Nations that's trying to advocate a, a ceasefire in an attempt to bring about a power sharing agreement. But the, um, the UN Security Council Resolution 2216, which is the, the mechanism through which a number of these things are taking place, still calls for a Houthi surrender. It doesn't adequately reflect the facts on the ground. The STC is missing, tribal groups are missing, local authorities aren't adequately represented, neither are political parties and civil society actors. So there's a great deal that's missed either locally or by the, uh, the international community's uh, response to this. And um, if I may, Nadwa has written a wonderful piece recently for the Middle East Institute that advocate that acknowledges a number of these problems um, and even perhaps rejects the premise of power sharing more broadly. And apologies if I'm, uh, if I'm taking your argument a little bit further than perhaps you did, but perhaps even rejecting the idea of power sharing as, as, a, as a solution to the Yemeni conflict, as a Western imposition. And that's, I think, something very important and something that must be reflected on. But I think the idea of power sharing is, is one that, that perhaps is, is useful and that it, it, it offers a framework in which people can operate together. What happens after that, of course, is incredibly difficult and preventing the descent into a zombie power sharing mess as of Lebanon and elsewhere is, is incredibly difficult. And actually getting to the point where people can agree to work together is incredibly challenging. Getting different groups to give up on their maximist uh, demands is incredibly difficult when those demands are so fundamental to their very essence. So you've got a lot of challenges. Trying to bring a, uh, find a way that brings all these different actors together without creating space for spoilers to dismantle the project or to, to privilege one group over the other is incredibly difficult, let alone actually facilitating a means of, of governing that allows all these different actors to, to have space. We had an event just before Christmas where um, we, we were speaking about peace building in Yemen. And one of the more interesting ideas was, was one that advocated a ground up local institutions um, working with one another and then sort of building from the bottom rather than top down. And it strikes me that that might be the way to go rather than a top down approach, a bottom up approach but that still will require people working together, different groups that have long been opposed to one another working together. And finding ways of doing that, I think is, is perhaps the biggest challenge for the international community, if the international community has a role to play, but also for Yemenis themselves. And I think that's where I'll leave it. Thank you very much. Well, thanks so much indeed, uh, Simon. I think you, 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 you've set out the difficulties and complexities extremely well. Uh, I, I thought it was a, a daunting task before us, uh, before you spoke. I'm even more convinced now it's far more daunting than even I thought. Uh, but you referred to Nadwa, and I think uh, Nadwa is the next speaker. So if you'd like to speak for about uh, seven, eight, nine minutes, that'd be great. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you very much for having me. And thank you, Simon, for the great introduction. And you're absolutely right. Uh, I do reject the power share um, agreement that's been discussed now. I, I call it political settlement. Um, and that's not only because it's not inclusive enough of all the groups that you've articulated very well, but the question is, is Yemen ready for a political settlement? Is Yemen ready for power share as, as it is now? Um, but before uh, going on to that, I just want to say one thing, uh, one very important point is that Yemen conflict is not sectarian, although there are elements of sectarianism are evolving. And if the conflict pro prolong, you know, um, longer, it, it might become a, a real issue in the future. Um, so my, you know, my first advice is it would be a mistake to think about Yemen conflict or solutions for that matter for the conflict through a secretarian lens. Um, the problem is not secretarian identities, but the power dynamics. Um, and here I wanna take this opportunity to show how the international community, the UN and the international community have not only failed to help Yemen, um, but how the power sharing 
agendas that the UN and international community have adopted not only did not help Yemen, but also made the conflict much worse. And let me go back to, to 2011, uh, you know, when the Arab Spring happened and the Yemenis rallied uh, in the street demanding the removal of former President Ali Abdullah Saleh. What happened then is that the international community intervened. Um, and there was the Gulf Cooperation Council initiative, which is the GCC initiative. It's brokered by the Saudis, but it was largely, um, you know, backed by the US, UK, and the international community. So now that initiative was deeply flawed. And it was deeply flawed because, um, you know, again, it, it, it focused on the political elite at the national level. It focused on the power struggle among the, the political elite at the national level, but it, it failed to understand, it failed to um, uh, address the grievances that led to the Arab Spring and the protests. And that's been a pattern that we have seen with, with basically all uh, adopted and you know advocated for uh, power sharing agreements. So back to the GCC initiative in 2011, again, it was deeply flawed because one, it granted former President Saleh immunity from prosecution, but he remained in control of most of the armed forces. Um, it proposed, uh, you know, it, well, it mandated a, a power share, a government that shared power 50%, 50% for the former ruling party and opposition. Um, so it was, it was more like a recycle of the same corrupt, corrupt political elite, but the, the demands of the youth uh, were, were not addressed. So instead of focusing on underlying causes of the conflict, that initiative focused on the political elite. Um, and the power dynamics. Um, the transition government was caught in fierce competition among the political elite. It failed to deliver. Saleh, who still had control over most of the military and security forces and was bitter because he was pushed out of power uh, through that transition deal, he allied with the Houthi rebels and they staged a coup and took over the capital city of Sana'a in 2014 and then dragged the entire country into a civil war. Um, so the GCC initiative or the power share uh, created conditions that led us straight to the war. But, but it didn't end there. Um, I, I wanna talk about the current UN peace process of you know, UN led negotiations. I really hate to call it peace process because it doesn't really have, you know, I, and I'm not judging the intentions. Uh, I like to call it UN led peace, UN led negotiations, um, which started in 2014 basically. But um, I'll try to be brief because I don't have much time. So the current UN-led process that's led by, by Martin Griffith is also deeply flawed. Um, it has not worked. It's not going to work. And why? Again, because it's too fixated on a power share between the Houthis and Hadi government. Um, again, as Simon explained, it, it, it does not include all these different forces that have legitimacy and influence on the ground. Um, probably more than both the Houthis and, and, and the Hadi government. Um, so uh, it, it also, more importantly, it also fails to account for the power dynamics and the, and the military situation on the ground. It, it basically offers very simplistic solutions for an extremely complex conflict. Um, so a power share agreement under the current circumstances is not going to solve Yemen conflict. Um, uh, because um, because of one thing, if you look at the situation on the ground, the Houthis control 70% of the population, but they have the upper hand militarily. And while the UN and the international community can have successfully in the past and can put pressure on the Saudis and Hadi's government to force them to de-escalate several mm -hmm. times, and it happened, it forced them to de-escalate several times, the international community does not have that kind of leverage on the Houthis and the Houthis are not willing to de-escalate. In fact, it's the opposite. So if, you know, diplomacy cannot work if you don't have leverage, um, especially if, if that side that you don't have leverage on is unwilling to, co to cooperate. Um, and I'll go to one mistake, the Stockholm agreement that was brokered by the UN envoy in December, 2018. It was meant to one, prevent government forces from retaking the Hodeida seaport from Houthis, but two, prepare for, for power share. So what happened? So the Saudis and the government stopped the, the military offensive at Hodeida, but the Houthis, what they did, they exploited that ceasefire and they regrouped and they took all their forces 
and made substantial military gains since 2018. And now they're threatening Marib City, which is the last stronghold of the government, has been uh, you know, a, a, a stable zone, a pocket of stability, but also it has 3 million civilians. Um, and so it actually, so what, what the Stockholm Agreement did inadvertently, it, it played into the hands of the Houthis. It tipped the military balance in their favor. It allowed them to expand and, and make substantial military gains. Um, so, and I think the same thing will happen now. And now people are talking, uh, the US have uh, appointed an envoy. Martin Griffith has been working really hard trying to get the Saudis to agree with the Houthis and you know, political settlement and all of that. And I appreciate all these efforts. But at the same time, again, it's disconnected from the reality because the Houthis have expanded militarily. They're, they're, they are de-escalating. De they're not willing to de-escalate. They're not listening to any calls for de-escalation. But at the same time, this is a group that does not recognize any Yemeni actor. They define the conflict as it's between them and Saudi Arabia. All other actors to them, including the government uh, of Yemen and all the other groups that um, Simon mentioned, they consider them mercenaries or ISIS. Um, they believe in a divine right to rule over Yemenis as descendants of Prophet Muhammad. So either you accept them or you're the enemy. Um, and again, now they're threatening the last stronghold of the Yemeni government and they're not willing to de-escalate despite so many calls by, you know, basically the entire diplomatic community. Um, so a power share under the current circumstances, in my opinion, will only, will not bring peace. It will only seal Houthi's military victory with a political recognition, uh, further complicating Yemen conflict. Um, so if I want to say something, I want to say that the UN and international, the, the, sorry, the power share um, um, initiatives by the UN and the international community in the past and so far have only helped reinforce the, the, the traditional dynamics, military and political dynamics um, and exacerbated the conflict as a result. So the question is not only is Yemen ready for a power share, but also can Yemen afford another elite centric power share, which I think what is now on the table. Thank you. I'll just leave it at that and I'm, I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much indeed. That's uh, another dimension I think that uh, begs a heck of a lot of quite fundamental questions really about how we might approach the situation. Uh, next contributor we've got is Misa and uh, I'd ask you to speak for about eight minutes as well too if you could please. Thank you. I thank you very much for this. Um, I will uh, second on Nadwa that uh, the sectarian division is not the core of the Yemeni conflict. Uh, first of all, the sectarian division in Yemen, it is regional tribal division in its first level. So we are, when we are talking about Zaidi in Yemen, it means almost he is from the north, from the north of Sana'a actually. So it doesn't mean something sectarian because um, the differences between the Sunni and the Zaydis in practice and jurisprudence are just few, are, are, not just, are not very important and major. The only difference is it is the political theory of imama for the Zaydis and the Zaydi imama that is justifying the rebellion against the ruler which, uh, which explained the Houthi behavior. And um, it's also restrict this ruling uh, for the dissidents of the prophet who, who's named in Yemen, the Hashemites. So this is the main distinguishing and it is a political one. And the Zaydis, actually there was a Zaydi hegemony in Yemen for centuries. So the idea, the perspective that the Houthis, they are victims or marginalized, it's not true. If we are going to talk about marginalization, about victimhood, so we are going to talk about the Yemenis in the West, on the East, not about the Yemenis in the North, actually. So um, I think the sectarian, uh, still the sectarian identity is not, um, most of the Yemenis they didn't recognize the sectarian division, actually. Because of that, most of the warring parties, they are using two discourses in this war. For example, the Salafis and the Brotherhood, they are using the discourse, the religious discourse for their circles, for the insiders, 
Um, but for the public, they are using the idea that we are defending the Republic against Imama, which is the Houthis. And for the Houthis, they are using also the religious discourse for the insider, for their circle. But for, but for the public, they are using another discourse, which is that, that we are the Yemeni party that are defending Yemen from external enemies from the Saudis. So this means that they are, they know both of them that the sectarian discourse never wins in Yemen and is not attractive for the, most of the Yemenis. So, and also the division between Yemenis is about politics, about region more than it is about sectarian. But I can't ignore that the sectarian power is supported by the regional, uh, the regional powers outside of Yemen, which make them big, which make them very effective, very powerful on the ground, military-wise, but not politically-wise. Um, about sharing power, um, Yemen has many attempts of field attempts <laughs> of sharing power. It fell in the 90s and it led to civil war in 1994. It fell in 2011 and it led to civil war again. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea is not a magic. Yeah, it's many people talk about sharing power as if it's a magic and everything will be fine. It's not this is the case with the Yemenis. They have many, many uh, experience of failed sharing power between themselves. I believe the war this, in this war, it's very difficult to share power. First of all, there's imbalance of power between the different warring parties, the Houthis, is overconfident. And actually, the Saudis and their Yemeni allies lose, lose the war. And they can't shift the trajectory of the war to, um, to their behalf, ex except they win the southern territories. More than this, they can't do anything more. So um, the Houthis now, they are behaving on their areas as a de facto power, de facto ruler. Uh, they are changing the educational curriculum. They are spreading their ideology. They are forcing their social code. For example, the woman should wear this and don't wear that, and uh, uh, separation between women and men. So I don't think this attitude means that they are going or they are willing to share power. They are feeling they are very comfortable with this war. The war gives them the legitimacy that they need. And they it equip them from um, the people's demands. I mean, the Houthi they collect last year, according the, according to the UN report, they collect more than one and a half billion dollars taxes from the people. In return, they didn't provide any service. They didn't provide any salaries because they are fighting, and everything is going to the war. So, what will drive the Houthis? to the negotiation and to share power? This is the question. And I have to say, one of the things that make sharing power in Yemen always um, is not a good idea. <laughs> it is the disregarding of the idea of the local governance. Um, we always dismiss this idea. It is very important because the successful models in Yemen now or the stable areas in Yemen, they are local governance models in Marib, in Shabwa, in Hadramaut, all of them, they were ruled by local actors because those local actors are in contact with the society day by day. They have a, a personal relationship with the society. It's something different than when you come from Riyadh and control the people and your family in Riyadh, for example, and you don't care, actually, because um, in the local governance, if they are local actor, I can't provide something to my home. I can't provide service without providing this service for all the community. The same thing goes with the Houthis. They are now the Houthis, they build parallel system to the state institution. And this system, we are talking about thousands of supervisors. Those people, where, where are they going if the war ends and we go, go, we say that we told to the Houthis, okay, we have you have to dismiss all of these thousands of people who are now controlling the country, take money from the people, and do whatever they want, and they are immune. Actually, it's very difficult to think about these details now. Those supervisors, this network of supervisors, 
they are controlling everything and 90% of them, they are from Saba. And they don't understand the mentality of most of the local communities in Yemen. And they don't care about this uh, communities because they are from totally different area, from isolated tribal governate, from a very marginalized governate. And when they are dealing with cities, big cities like al Hodeida, like Sana'a, or with the, when they are dealing with totally different society in Eb, it's another story. Also, we have to understand that the Houthis inherited the state institutions, the state capabilities of Yemen because it was a very centralized state in Sana'a. Adding to this, they are very organized, they are well structured. So I doubt, and they have their vision, whether we are agreeing with this vision or we are not, but they have a clear vision and they want to apply this vision to the society. And they are starting this. I did, I, they start I already this. So how we can shift or change all of this? We, they don't have any incentive to end the war. We don't have, uh, they are overconfident and they are expanding military actually to Marib. So I, I doubt, I really doubt that this war can be end. It can be end on its regional level. Like the Houthis can compromise with the Saudis. I don't think it is, they have a really problem with the Saudis, but on the local level, it's very difficult. And thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. I, I, again, I think that, um, that that poses many questions. I mean, if you, if you don't think that the uh, the agenda, as we've tried to set it out, is not really realistic, then what is the alternative? On what sort of agenda do we need to be exploring? Thank you very much indeed. Okay, last but by. No means least, can you make your contribution, please? Seven to eight minutes. Oh, thank you very much. Um, so my work over the last 12 years or so has been primarily focused on conflict prevention and peace building efforts uh, happening at the community level in Yemen, um, as well as working in particular with women's groups and youth groups. So I'm going to talk a bit less about those kind of formal power sharing models, although I share a lot of Nadwa and Misa's skepticism. Um, and a little bit more about those kind of community relationships that are such an important element of building sustainable peace through any model, that kind of more bottom up thing that Simon was talking about. Um, more recently, I've also been working on some new research with a couple of colleagues from the Yemen Policy Center. You can see that Yazid's on the call uh, um, uh, on the role of creative arts in peace building. So if I have time, I'm going to talk a tiny bit about that as well. Um, so the war in Yemen has exacerbated pre-existing social, political, geographic and religious divisions and created new ones. Um, but as Misa was saying, um, historically religious differences have been of limited importance to people in Yemen and sectarianism is really not ever been a driver of conflict or a mobilizing frame for violence in Yemen. It's much more of an overlap of geographic identities, political identities. However, what we are seeing um, is a rise in religious and sectarian rhetoric, not just from prominent national voices, but also in the everyday lives of Yemenis. Um, so stereotyping of each other uh, based on last name or where you come from. So you see, oh, you're from uh, this area, you must be pro Hadi. Oh, your last name is this, you must be pro Houthi. Um, so that's sort of bubbling away at a community level, although it's very much political differences feeding this sectarianism and not vice versa. Um, it's also being this sectarian rhetoric is being deliberately manipulated and spread as part of the war tactics of various conflict actors, but particularly the Houthis through schools, through mosques, through local TV shows, through uh, local radio and, and through social media. However, um, at Yemen Polling Center, we talk to Yemenis all over the country and um, religious differences are still really not playing any role in localized driving local conflicts. What's causing unrest uh, in most communities is the lack of availability of food, of fuel, of medicine, lack of jobs, um, land disputes and housing. Um, 
really not these kind of religious religious uh, differences that get talked about at this like, sort of fancy academic level. Um, so I work a lot with civil society um, and growing these growing political and social divisions are also affecting our, uh, civil society and activist groups in Yemen, uh, who, in my opinion, are one of the cornerstones to building peace <laughs> in Yemen in the lo long term. Uh, so it's been it's increasingly difficult for um, civil society actors to move around the country to meet with other activists. Uh, it's really difficult to produce any work uh, or do any work without being labelled as serving the agenda of a particular conflict actor. And even in uh, in Sanaa at the moment, even using the word peace arouses suspicion and can bring you huge amounts of problems from the local Houthi authorities. Um, Really love that Mysa mentioned women. Obviously going to talk a bit about women. Um, local conflict actors, the Houthis in particular, but other, um, other actors as well, are manipulating traditional and religious gender norms to further prevent women's participation and attack women who st seem to step out of line. Um, so there's, as Mysa mentioned, enforcement of more regressive norms around dress codes and women's visibility. Um, using issues like mixed gender attendance at a, at a meeting as a pretext to shut things down, which is a really problematic thing for civil society. Uh, and I really agree with Mysa there that this is not the actions of groups that are ready for some kind of inclusive power sharing uh, situation. Um, at the same time, violent actions against women that would have been previously considered shameful, like detention and torture of women, uh, have proliferated, sadly. Um, as well as the recruitment, despite the Houthis, for example, talking about how women shouldn't work, they recruit women into uh, their units as informers, uh, the police or the women. So what we're seeing is a massively restricted space for civic activism, particularly for, for young people and for, for women. However, despite this, we're seeing community groups, youth groups, women's groups continue to come together particularly at a very local level, and finding spaces and ways of working towards peace. Uh, and it's, it's things like spearheading local humanitarian interventions in spaces that others, particularly internationals, cannot reach. Um, often assuming the roles of like what should be state or public institutions, like providing education centers, health centers, distributing food and water, they're organizing the community. Often you'll find women in youth groups organizing local um, uh, talks and discussions and negotiations. Um, and also you find a lot of women's groups in particular providing psychosocial support for vulnerable uh, children and adults in their area. And for me, it's really at this level of kind of community engagement where a great deal of the opportunities lie for laying the groundwork for peace. So I think I've got a minute or two left. So I'm just going to say a tiny bit about my, I realise it seems a little off topic, but I promise you it's not, my work on arts and peace building. Um, so me and my colleagues Yazid and who's on the call and Majid, um, we've been talking to artists and peace builders in lots of different areas of Yemen. And what we're, what we're seeing is that um, some of the biggest opportunities for peace building and rebuilding uh, social cohesion really is like about recognizing the different types of activities that can ultimately contribute to this. Uh, and arts, uh, creative, the creative arts are a really, really important part of that. So creative arts are often seen as, as, as soft. They're often soft, <laughs> particularly when we're talking about power sharing. Um, they're often small in scale, but actually they're potentially better placed than formal processes to deal with the complexity of conflict, the messiness, of conflict and also the emotional content of conflict that we often don't really talk about. Um, also helps us thinking about uh, creative arts, so painting, writing, storytelling, uh, theatre, music, comedy. Um, it helps us broaden out our thinking about what peace building efforts can look like away from that kind of traditional focus on institution building like military and political arrangements and those top down negotiation frameworks and actually a space for something that could be much more inclusive. 
So uh, just briefly, what we've managed to find is all sorts of arts and cultural activities that are happening in Yemen, despite all of the difficulties and the difficulties around freedom of expression in Yemen at the moment. So you've got pop stars making music videos about tolerance and not using sectarian language. You've got uh, women's organizations in places like Marib using traditional forms of poetry to do campaigns against child recruitment. You've got theater and comedy performances in places like Tired and McCullough that are bringing communities together and bringing communities together in a kind of joy. Um, and even in Sanaa, where the restrictions from the Houthi authorities are probably the, the harshest for trying to do arts, um, there's still people bringing young women together to learn the violin. And while they're not gonna be able to perform publicly right now, there's a real sense of this is an important part of what we want our, our, our Yemeni future to be. Um, so my friend and colleague, um, Atiyaf Al-Wazir, um, she says that dealing with violent conflict is essentially about dealing with brokenness. So a brokenness of society, a brokenness of community and a brokenness of individuals, which often just doesn't get talked about when we're talk talking about these kind of formal arrangements to bring men with guns to the table. Um, and arts and cultural activities, we're finding can really provide that kind of essential space uh, for society to begin to mend. Okay. Right, well, well, thank you very much indeed. That's a, a very, very different take on what we've had so far, but nevertheless, a very, very worthwhile contribution, I think, to the discussion. Now, um, we come to the, the other interesting part of our seminar. Now, I have to say, there's a heck of a lot of comments in the chat, but uh, very few questions there, but nevertheless, extremely worthwhile comments, which people clearly feel very, very strongly about. Uh, but I've got a number of, of questions uh, which have been submitted. And I think the first one is probably for me. So if, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll, I'll deal with that one quickly. Uh, it's about the, the announcement of the British government is reducing its uh, aid to, to Yemen by nearly 50%. And what is my response to that? Well, I think there's an extremely retrograde step taken by the Boris Johnson government. I think at, uh, at a crucial time in, in the Yemen situation facing, as Simon has said, the world's worst humanitarian crisis. It's uh, reprehensible, I think, but the British government, one of the largest aid donors, has decided to reduce support by 50%. And I think that sends out a very, very negative message about the moral priorities of the government in Britain. Uh, but also, I think that uh, it makes it that much more difficult, really, to move towards a ceasefire and some kind of uh, peace arrangement. So that's my position on that. I'm absolutely against it and quite disgusted by what the British government has decided to do. But if, if, I, if I could just make another comment. I mean, much of my personal experience as a young man was witnessing what had happened in Northern Ireland. And I know people have made the comments about it's perhaps not right and proper to make European comparisons to the situation is in the Middle East and, and Yemen in particular. But nevertheless, I think that the situation in, in Northern Ireland uh, is worth looking at just for a moment, because there you had a situation where you had six, 700 years of conflict between two communities. And I think that the feeling was after the, uh, the outbreak of relatively recent violence, but it was not possible for any one side to gain victory, either the British state or the Irish nationalists. And in a sense, there was something of a historic compromise because Northern Ireland has got a great deal of autonomy and a real relationship with, with Southern Ireland, which it didn't have before. Uh, but at the same time, the, the nationalist community in the North uh, put to one side, at least for the foreseeable future, their idea of a united island. So there was a, a compromise, really, a historic compromise between the, the two main protagonists there. And that created the, the space for some kind of 
civil engagement really to, to work and construct peaceful relationships and break down the historic sectarian divides. But from what I've heard from you today, the situation in Yemen is very, very different and far more complicated even than the situation in, in Northern Ireland. So the question I want to ask is one which has been suggested by a, a number of contributors, uh, is that if, as we've been saying for some time, it's not possible to have a, a military solution, a military victory by one side, but nevertheless, the impression I get is that the Houthis clearly believe that it's possible for them to win the war. Um, and, 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 and unless we move to our acceptance of stalemate, there's no real chance for a ceasefire and moving on from a ceasefire to peaceful developments. So my question, first of all, is that do we think it's really possible for the international community and Biden in particular, to exercise real influence, uh, not just with the, the Saudi coalition, but over the Houthis, for them to recognize that victory is not possible. Do we think it's, it's necessary to, to get to that situation first? I, I think possibly it does. Uh, there needs to be that military stalemate before we can talk about other developments. So my question is, do you agree with that? Uh, who'd like to venture an answer? Nadwa? I can take that. Yeah, I can take that. Um, I, I don't think, uh, under the current circumstances, I don't think diplomacy will work. Uh, again, because Houthis believe that they have the upper hand militarily, and they do, and they continue to expand, and they want to take Marib, and if they take Marib, then they'll venture south, and they'll, they'll try to retake Aden as well. Um, so Biden lost the one leverage that he could have used on the Houthis, um, the um, revoking the designation, the FTO designation. He could have used that as a, as a leverage to at least get the Houthis to, um, you know, give some concessions. But he lost that leverage, and the way he revoked the resignation, in fact, showed that he is too desperate to come to any form of agreement with the Houthis, um, and that emboldened them. So the second day after he revoked the designation, they launched a massive offensive to to take Marib City, which is again the last stronghold of the government, and they're now threatening the city. Um, so I, you know, I don't think that the Biden administration, um, you know, got off the, you know, right foot um, on this. Um, I mean, reali realistic realistically speaking, in order for a political solution to happen, the Houthis have to be weakened militarily. Now, can they be weakened militarily? Yes, if there is like a military strategy, and if the UN stops asking the Saudis and the Yemeni government to de-escalate in Marib because they need to be pushed away, far away from Marib where Marib, you know, the last stronghold of the government is safe and where they feel weak enough to come to the table and agree with others. But right now they don't feel the need. They don't feel, they're, they're, you know, they don't, they don't feel that kind of pain. Uh, so they're not going to agree. But, you know, there is, I think most probably that will not happen. Uh, given the trajectory and the way the Saudis and the Yemeni government have completely mismanaged this war. So what can be done meanwhile? I think one thing, what, can, what should not be done is a political deal that will make matters worse. In my opinion, a no deal is better than a bad deal. And we've seen how in Yemen bad deals just made things much, much more complicated, much more complicated and, and, and much more worse, much worse. Um, so what could happen um, is look at pockets of stability and try to to uh, stab to to promote these pockets of stability. Um, Houthis only control thirty percent of the of the geography. There is seventy percent of the geography that's under the control of you know various actors. Some are aligned with the government, some are against the government, but they're relatively stable. And so one thing has to happen: one, try to bring these all anti-Houthi forces together politically. Um, two. Uh, try to support stability in these areas. So, you know, promote local economy, uh, local security, infrastructure, 
kind of stabilize these areas. And over time, you know, hopefully that will will um, will uh, you know raise demand for peace uh, in other places. And look, you know, this is a very difficult conflict and very complicated. And I think to ask for Yemen to be back a one country under a central government is also extremely <laughs> ambitious. And so we have to keep our expectations, you know, uh, we have to have keep our expectations low. And Yemen conflict is just like any other conflict. It will run its course. And all we can do right now is to mitigate the impact of the conflict. The UN envoy can work with the parties to try to like open roads, seaports, airports, uh, pay the, the salaries for people and, and you know, government employees in, in, in Houthi control areas, all these arrangements that will, will help at least mitigate the impact of the conflict on, on ordinary Yemenis while there is no you know, an end, an, an end to the conflict. So you know, various things can happen. And, and um, you know, Kate, she, she gave an excellent presentation. Absolutely agree with her. Civil society, not only, in my opinion, the silver lining in this conflict is civil society. They have evolved and grow, grew so much during the conflict because they're not dependent on the donors. Um, they found themselves, you know, in a situation where there is war, donors have withdrawn and their communities had needs and they responded to their communities needs. And I think that's, that's absolutely fascinating. And one day it will materialize, you know, in a, in a much larger scale, so. Well, well thanks very much for that. Would, would anybody else like to come in? Simon? Yeah, thanks. I'd echo uh, everything that Nadu was saying and also just to um, advocate for that softer approach that, that Kate was, was talking so powerfully and wonderfully about with music and art. I think it's so powerful and so very important for actually transforming the way that people view one another. And that's fundamentally what conflict's about, the, the, the perception of the other and how um, how the, the baggage that comes with that is, is viewed in positive or negative ways. So anything that can help break down some of those tensions and as a former violin player myself, Kate, I was pleased to hear that, um, that the violin is being taught. But uh, just to build on what Nadwa was saying, that there has been this, um, this relationship between um, the Hardy government and the STC recently in the past few months, which as far as I'm aware, it seems to be holding, maybe to the surprise of a few, but I think that maybe tells you something about the fear of the Houthis. But I guess there's a, there's a degree of a precarious relationship between the government, the STC, and the various other groups that, that exert influence in, in Yemen, um, which is what makes all of this so very difficult to get to a point where the Houthis are pushed to a position where they're weak enough to feel that they have to negotiate. But all of this is playing out sort of at, at an elite level, sort of top down level, where the, it's, it's the civil society, it's the, the people of Yemen who are paying that the heaviest of prices um, in the face of, of competition between strong men, strong man and strong man. And it's, it's, it's devastating. And to think that global Britain decides to cut its funding and its aid at a time when um, all of this is happening is, I'll, I'll say a slightly stronger word, it's abhorrent. I would certainly agree with the, the use of that word, absolutely. And could I also say, I play the oboe as well to Kate, so uh, there, there's something else which uh, potentially unites us. Kate, did you want to say it something to, to, to explain? artistic capability. <laughs> <laughs> did you want to say something to, to, to expand upon your view, which, which seems to have some resonance amongst the other participants? Um, yeah, I'm... I'm I agree very much with what Nadwa was saying, um, but I think we're not looking. So what Yemenis need absolutely is a cessation of the violence, 100%. Um, however, they also need an awful lot of other things in order to be able to live safe and secure lives. So there needs to be a resumption of uh, basic services. Um, there needs to be a resumption of salaries to public sector workers. Um, and this, the, this stuff um, can, can happen and can start happening now. And there's, I really worry, um, as, much as, I, as much as I want to see an inclusive peace agreement, I really worry that we put off 
working on other things whilst we're waiting for this ephemeral top like uh, elite agreement that even if it happens even if we have some kind of um signed agreement between one two three of the conflict groups we're still going to see conflict unfortunately play out at a local level in Yemen for a long time we're not the idea of a central state of any kind in Yemen I think is a bit as much as we may want some of us may want that um, I think it's somewhat illusory and a bit of a red herring uh, when what we need to be doing is making sure people have food they have water they have health care uh, particularly when we're in a global pandemic well, th thanks for that I mean I, th I think we'd all agree but you know, to achieve a ceasefire is as of tremendous importance. Can, can I ask you just a question about uh, how that, that might come about? Because, you know, Biden has a, has a strategy. He's concerned about the humanitarian crisis, but he's also concerned about uh, establishing some kind of, of, of peace, at least in the short term, to create a, a political space. And one of the things that he's exploring, I understand, is a new relationship between um, the, UN, the US and, and Iran. And uh, Iran has got some influence. It's debatable how much, but it has some influence over the Houthis. Do you think there's any, any mileage for the United States to pursue a, a, a pressure on the Houthis by Iran? Or do you think that's a non-starter? Meza? Uh, yeah, I think um, there is an influ Iranian influence in the Houthis, and it increased uh, th during the war. It wasn't that big, but uh, during the war, it, uh, it increased. It has been increased. And um, uh, the Iranian, I think they look to the Houthis as a cheap card. They didn't, they did, they don't cost them anything actually, but uh, they want from the from them a lot because they exhausting the Saudis and the conflict in Yemen is very far from Iran. So any implication of this conflict will not affect Iran in any time. So they can keep gambling as much as they can in Yemen without feeling of any threat or any problem in continuing this war or this conflict in Yemen. And this is a really dilemma because for the Saudis, Yemen, they, have, they share a long borders with the, uh, with the Yemenis and it is an essential thing for them. And they believe that they, they can't accept the Iranian influence on their southern borders. Uh, at the same time, the Iranian, they don't care or they don't feel that they are under any pressure to stop this war. But if we say that there is a kind of agreement and this agreement between the US and Iran involves some regional issues like Yemen war, so the Iranian concedes um, and, and presents some concessions on uh, the Yemeni file and returns something else, okay, I can say that it could help but we don't. Ha we have to not um, underestimate. We, we should not underestimate the historical legacy of the Houthis. The Houthis believe that they are the true rulers and or the only legitimate rulers for the Yemen, especially north of Yemen, because we are talking about a historical legacy of Zaidi Imama. It continued for centuries in this area, so. Uh, because of that, the Houthis, it's very difficult for them to concede for a long time. And through the negotiation with the Houthis in many times, uh, what we notice that the Houthis, their demands are moving. Sometimes it's there, it's very high. Sometimes it's very low. It depends to their military position. So they always rely on their military position and they always say something and do something because actually in their, they believe that they are the real ruler, rulers of Yemen. At the same time, they feel that they have to show a kind of uh, concessions. And I, I have to comment something about your first input, about very input, about that who uh, the Houthis didn't, uh, 
did not win the war or something that there is no victory in this war. For the militia, Houthi, they are militia. So for them, the meaning of victory is totally different than the Saudis. The Saudis are state and they, are, they have some international engagement. And for them, definitely victory is a different, totally different definition for the militia. For the militia, just keeping existing, it is a victory. We still alive, it is a victory whatever the situation of the country, but it is for them, it is, this is victory. And they believe that they are the winner party, regardless to the situation of the country. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much indeed. I mean, that's, a, that's an interesting point you're making about what is the, the, the goal of the, the, the different actors in it. One of the things which, which struck me, however, is that uh, Yemen has had a very centralized government, hasn't it, over the, the last uh, few years? I mean, are we correct in talking about uh, Yemen as though it is, has to be some sort of unitary state? Um, maybe it's more realistic to talk about a, a, a federation or a, a decentralized uh, yeah, I'm, I'm I totally of, agree. Of confederation, <laughs> I mean, yeah. perhaps we need to, to rethink really what our, mm. our assumptions are about the future of Yemen. Yeah, exactly. Would you agree with that? Uh, yeah, definitely. It must be. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I, Can you not yeah, I agree. I mean, I think I, I agree, and Risa is also a champion of this. Uh, you know, the international community are so desperate to bring a central government to function in to run the country from Sana'a, but that's just not plausible. I don't think it's plausible now. I don't think it's going to be plausible 10 years from now. Um, I think the one government ruling in the entire country, uh, even with a decentralized version of governance, is also far fetched, uh, given, you know, the, the, how this conflict evolved. I think we will see several Yemens probably connecting with each other somehow. Um, but uh, I agree with Mesa and I agree with you. I think the way forward to go is to focus on bottom up decentralized and not to have to connect it to like a national level. Um, one of the things that frustrate me with every donor these days is that they want to implement projects on security or economy, but they want to link it to the peace process. Why does it have to be linked to the peace process? I don't know. And I think that's just a, you know, a flaw. Um, but uh, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. Kate, did you indicate that you wanted to? Uh, yeah, well, I guess I sort of already answered that uh, in agreement with <laughs> Natura and Mike. You can tell we've worked together for a long time. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, it's, I, I think it's not just that it's not feasible, but it's also distracting us from doing that bottom up work. Um, and I, I think it's actually quite problematic to still be talking about a centralized Yemen state when what we should be talking about is the welfare and well-being of Yemeni citizens. And currently there is not going to be any state that can provide that centralized state uh, mm. that can provide that. However, I would put a caveat, and I haven't really thought this through. But in in, in our fragmented uh, in, our, in our fragmented Yemeni state whatever that might look like, I do then really, really worry about this, uh, the citizens and civil society that end up in a particularly repressive area with particularly repressive authorities, such as the Houthis, but the Houthis are not the only authorities that have some of those inclinations. Um, so, and like, what, what happens there? Like, do we just, you know, talk to the Maribis because it will be okay in Marib? Um, what about what about the Yemenis that are being oppressed? Hmm. You you pose a question there, <laughs> Simon. Would you like to try and respond to Kate's question? What what do you do about people who find themselves under an extremely repressive regime? Uh, no, I I don't think that I'm the right person to talk about that because I have nothing positive hmm. to say, unfortunately, about it, and I don't want to. To take away from um, from that, which I think is really important, and maybe leave it to, to Nadwa Kate or Mesa. Uh, but I just wanted to to come back to your question about the state. This sort of fetishization of the the Yemeni state seems so so inappropriate when we think about the the very purpose of a state, 
the purpose of a state is to provide for its people and to ensure that people have the protection, the care, the welfare, the institutional support that they need. Um, going back to Ibn Khaldun, he talks about politics being the survival of the species. So in sort of in the contemporary context, the state is the vehicle through which um, the, the citizens or the people residing within a particular territory are protected, their survival is ensured. But in the case of Yemen, the state isn't doing any of that. So to, to go back to this fetishized model of a state that doesn't meet any of the criteria of what we would typically identify when talking about a state seems to be absolutely uh, inappropriate, misguided, and perhaps reflects, I don't know, um, be it Western centricity of the importance of states and the Westphalian model of statehood, or um, dare I say the, the power of, of the donor community and its ability to make money. I don't know, um, just a couple of thoughts. I mean, I, I, mean, I personally think that uh, there's a big challenge there really for, for, for Western politicians, because I mean, uh, I, I frankly, admit that we tend to talk about Yemen and the assumption is that we talk about one unitary identity and uh, we need to have a rethink really and as a consequence of that uh, perhaps you know western states and the United Nations itself needs to slightly rethink how it might develop an agenda for for the future mm. yeah uh, can I answer uh, Kate yes please about a question uh, about Marib, why all the people concerned about Marib are not concerned about the people who are under the Houthi controlled area. Uh, I have to say the Houthi, they are controlling now the Zaidi area and the Zaidi area always subjected to any government coming from Sana'a, any ruler from Sana'a, they are easily subjected to them. They face some rebellion, tribal rebellion there and here and there, but nothing can be serious or threaten them there. And this area is tribal area actually, and its connection with the state historically wise, it's always weak. And um, the, the other area, which is um, the non zaidi area, they are the Hudayda, it is Al-Hudayda and Eb mainly. They are two, and the most of uh, taxes are coming and most of the revenues actually, and the economic revenues coming from those two cities actually. Because if the Houthis, they want to, punish one of their supervisors, they will send them to Jov or whatever in this remote area in the Zaid tribal areas. If they want to reward him, they will send him to uh, Eb or al Hudayda so he can find a lot of money to collect from the people. Uh, these areas are actually historically wise. They are not tribal, uh, socially wise. They are not tribal areas. The people are very peaceful and they are all easily subjected to that. Sana'a government. But in Eb, actually historically wise, Eb was always independent, was always independent from the state in Sana'a most of the time. And it is a tribal area, which is very difficult to accept the Houthi. The Houthis can take uh, Marib, military wise, they can't take Marib, but they can't control it. They can't control it like they are controlling Sana'a now, they are controlling Eb now, they can't control Marib. It's very difficult to control Marib. So the, the, the problem here that the people will be resentment, there is a resentment among the people will be raised from against the Houthis in Marib, and this will radicalize the community against them. This make maybe will make uh, some Sunni radical movement very attractive for the people there uh, to express their, their feeling of resentment. And it is, it's, it's important to understand that we are sacrificing one of the few stable areas in Yemen that is hosting 2 million displaced, internal displaced people, half of them in camps. Uh, so this is the danger from taking over Marib by the Houthis. Thank you. It, it's, it's a slightly, some, some would say a pessimistic scenario, but I mean, you know, it, some people have suggested that as the Houthis 
militarily appear to have the upper hand, they could take Marib. And uh, some people are saying, well, that is one way to end the war. Um, but other people have said, I know, but uh, if Marib were taken by the Houthis, there'd be a, an escalation of the humanitarian crisis with many people evacuating the city and basically going out into the desert. And the situation would be humanitarianly much, much worse. Marib Do you agree with that? To a very large number of people that have already been displaced from other yeah. areas. Yeah. <laughs> But not yeah. only humanitarian, though. I mean, the humanitarian aspect, of course, it will be the impact will be devastating because we have two million, I, you know, IDPs plus, you know, another million civilians who relocated to the governorate. But at the same time, if Houthis take Marib, like Mesa explained, when Houthis enter an area like that, when Houthis enter areas, what they do, they blow up homes, they execute tribal leaders, and they're very repressive. And there's already a huge resentment against the Houthis in Mara because these guys have been defending their governorate for five years, six years now, and they've lost thousands. And so they're not going to go, you know, they're not going to just uh, surrender to the Houthis. They might make agreement with some tribal leaders, but the majority of the people will not accept that. They've lost so much. Um, and so there will be uh, insurgency against them. And uh, as Mesa explained, some radical groups might offer a venue for them to fight the Houthis. I mean, it's the enemy of my enemy, not because people are, are, are radical, but you know, there's, they're so, they would be very frustrated and very helpless that that's, that would be a, that would their only option. And that would destabilize one of the, if not the most stable area in Yemen that hosts millions of civilians, but not only that, if Houthis take Marib, They'll move to Shabwa, they'll move to Hadramur. These are oil rich governorates, again, relatively stable in the south. Um, and that will give them revenues to continue their wars and retake Aden. So it will be, it will be disastrous in terms of you know, the, the scale of the, the, con the violence that will emerge because if they, if they take Marib, it will be much worse than the stalemate we're in right now. Yeah. Um, I have to add uh, yes, to Nadwa that the Houthis reach, reached their maximum of capacity as rulers, actually, because they are a minor group by the end of the day. And they didn't, uh, and they refused to include people, a lot of people from outside of their core because uh, they are suspecting everyone and they don't trust the people easily. So it's very difficult for them to expand uh, their ruler, uh, the ruling outside of their areas now. And they will face many, many, problems in controlling these communities. Thank mm. you. I mean, could I ask a question about the Houthis? I mean, you know, many of you are extremely critical of, of the, the nature of their movement, as it were. But I mean, it, it, it is very much uh, you know, a militia-based um, ad hoc amalgam of different groups, as I understand it. I mean, are there any elements which have different views within Houthis or are they all of singular one mind? Um, what I'm thinking of, is it, is it possible for negotiation to take place with, with some elements in the Houthi alliance or is it very, very difficult with all of them? Um, I will say this. <laughs> Uh, actually, the problem with the Houthis is that they are a movement that emerged from war, mm. through war. And they are fighting for 17 years, year, years now. They are fighting since 2000, uh, 2004. So we are talking about people who start fighting when they, are teenage, when they were teenagers, when they were children, like Abdul Malik al Houthi himself. So they used to fight. This is one of the really, really big problems. And I believe that nothing will make the Houthis more pragmatic and more than being in power, relaxed, without war. And this will, so they will lose one of their advantages. But now they, they used to fight. And this is one of the problems that, that this is a fighting group and it's core. Cool. And this makes them very uh, ideologically, they are very strict and very close minded. They are coming from mountains. Big part of them, they never see sea, the sea, the sea. When they go to Adan, 
one of their problems that they, for the first time, they saw <laughs> they are they saw sea, they saw coast and beach. It's so most of them they are coming from very remote, remote and isolated areas, and we have to understand this mentality is very difficult to deal with, and it may take time. I, I, I believe it it will take time. And, and people talk also, I would add to Lisa, people talk about Houthi moderates, and there are a few Houthis who are very attractive. If you sit with them and discuss with them, they're very smart, very intelligent, very articulate, um, but they're not the ones who are calling the shots. They're, they're only a facade of, you know, talk to outside actors, but the people who, have, who own the decision-making uh, are, are, are ideologues, the radicals. In fact, these were the people who celebrated the FT FTO designation. Um, they, you know, they they take um, you know sanctions. They they wear sanctions as badges of honor. Um, that kind of mentality. I mean, they're they're and and I'm, I'm citing their own materials, media propaganda, their leaders, uh, you know, statements. They are on a holy war. They're on a holy war. And their stated objective is not only liberating all of, all of Yemen, but also going beyond Yemen, liberating Mecca and Jerusalem. I mean, and you know, I go back to, the, to Iran, uh, and Iran did such a, an intelligent work with the Houthis, really smart, little investment, but long-term impact. Iran does not control the Houthis. It doesn't have much influence on the Houthis. It's a partnership, but it's also a shared commitment. Um, and so it's, it's really hard to reason with that. Can I move a discussion in the last few minutes slightly onwards? I and mean, there's a big debate, and it's been raised by a number of people in the, in the, the chat, about the, the arms trade and the fact that uh, Britain you know, does supply a large amount of arms to Saudi Arabia in particular. And there's been a lot of criticism of the British government for, for doing that. Uh, I think the, the United States has had at least... Uh, a short-term uh, arms embargo on Saudi Arabia. Is that of any significance? And what do you think the, the British government should do to try and help the situation? Who'd like yeah, to be first? Let me say that as a, as, a, <laughs> as a British activist on this, or would you rather give it Yemeni? Well, yes, I mean, yeah. Simon could come in and then perhaps Kate. Well, maybe Kate first, given that I think she's got a particularly strong view on this that I think is very important. Mm. Um, yes, it's a very much not a view that re relates specifically to Yemen, though. So it sort of does, but uh, <laughs> I'll, I, I'm interested to hear what uh, uh, Nadwa and Maisa have. But um, essentially, um, answering this with my British citizen hat on and my peace activism in the UK hat on, I want to see. Uh, a complete abolition of the arms, <laughs> international arms industry. So just to frame it, uh, but what we're yeah, what we're seeing is um, huge, huge amounts of arms uh, going to Saudi for use in Yemen throughout uh, the conflict. So I think since the war began, we've seen 6.8 billion uh, arms licensed, but that doesn't include include all of the open issue export licenses. That's a really, it's a really cautious estimate. So it's huge, huge amounts of money. But it's also worth bearing in mind that it's not just about making the UK money, which is bad enough that we're trying to make money off uh, other people's uh, conflict and misery. Uh, we also actually, as a UK government, subsidize this industry hugely. And we could switch those subsidies into things that are good for the world, like renewable energy. So we could transition our jobs in arms manufacturing in the UK over to jobs in renewables, uh, renewable energy in the UK. Um, I'm a member, I'm a member of um, Campaign Against Arms Trade, and some of you will be aware, but Campaign Against the Arms Trade have uh, taken the UK government to court uh, on their selling of arms to Saudi because it breaks our own law. Um, and we're currently, so um, it's been a bit of an on off process, but essentially um, in last year, the government announced that it had done a review and is going to be resuming arms sales to Saudi. And CAT is taking that to, Campaign Against Arms Trade is taking that to appeal. So on the basis of our own British laws, 
we are breaking our own laws selling arms to Saudi. However, I would say that this is only one part of what is happening in the Yemen conflict. And I do worry sometimes um, about um, the focus that this brings, that this, because we've got such good activism here on, in the UK on this, but the focus this brings on international humanitarian law violations and human rights violations by the Saudis, uh, which are horrendous, um, but that also obscures all of the uh, human rights violations by other actors on the ground. So we need to be talking, we, we talk about Saudi because we, the UK government are supplying out arms to, that's who we're supplying arms to. We don't really talk about what the UAE are up to, even though we supply arms to the UAE as well. And the UAE have got secret prisons, uh, they're detaining and torturing people. Um, and it does sometimes obscure what can be uh, as big a threat on the ground for many Yemenis from other conflict actors. Mm. Can make I a add? number of good points of MAC. Can I add to that? Nadva? Yeah, and I, uh, you know, I, I really appreciate all the uh, advocacy against arms sale, and I, you know, it's very important. And I, as a Yemeni, I would like to see Saudi Arabia exiting Yemen at some point. Um, but there's one thing, you know, I want to say, and, and Kate mentioned that the ending arms sale to the Saudi is not going to end conflict. That's one thing. Uh, but at the same time, it's not also about focusing on human rights violations by the Saudis, but not human rights violations by, by the Houthis. It's also one thing I know, if airstrikes stopped right now, Houthis will be able to take Marib overnight. So by ending the arms sale, under these conditions, are we aiding the Houthi state Marib and then making the, the conflict in Yemen much worse? I think you know mm -hmm. people need to think about these also unintended unintended consequences when they advocate for uh, you know for arms sale. I honestly advocate for a more conditional arms sale rather than you know completely suspend arms sale under the current circumstances in Yemen. Of course, not you know not as a general rule. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, just specifically on, on arms sales, I mean, one of the things that the, the Labour opposition in Britain has been very critical of the last few weeks is arms sales to, uh, to Saudi Arabia, uh, not least because of other things which happen in, in Saudi Arabia as well. Um, but also we're saying there should be far greater scrutiny so that every single contract with Saudi Arabia and other countries is properly scrutinised uh, by Parliament and set aside the country's human rights record and how the, uh, the arms are being used, which is not the case at the moment. The government basically does what it's like and uh, quite often uh, ignores the law and uh, dances around the courts, which is Kate's point. We're, we're coming towards the end. Meza, would, would you like to say something uh, finally to, to conclude and then perhaps we'll finish yeah. with Simon where we began? Yeah, I have to say that ending the war should not be connected to inclusive political solution. Uh, first of all, we have to stop the war, cease fire uh, on the lines, on these lines, on the current lines, address the humanitarian um, issues, address some important issues like Al-Hudaida and messy situation that happened in this uh, governate and also like opening Sana'a airport by the coalition, lift uh, the blockade of, uh, of Anta'a city by the Houthis, some things that should, we should put uh, pressure on the warring parties on some issues, but the most thing that we should do, first of all, cease fire, stop the war now. Then we can talk about some solutions, some political solution based on decentralized sit state, uh, encouraging local governance, uh, many things we can talk about, M maybe dividing Yemen into different countries, whatever, but must uh, this war must stop on this front lines now. Uh, and the pressure should be on Iran, not the Houthis, because there is nothing to do with the Houthis when they when you did when you impose sanctions on the Abdel Malik al Houthi by the UN, he doesn't have passport, he doesn't have bank account. All of this nonsense. Uh, the pressure should be on Iran, Oman. Oman has a good relationship with the Houthis and they facilitate to them, to them a lot of things and they need Oman. 
always, so they can get some job with the Houthis. So the sh war should stop. Uh, the international community can can uh, can um, uh, force the Saudis to present uh, some concessions, but this leverage is not easy with the Houthis. So this thing should we go together? Uh, I I believe that ceasefire is a must now. Then talk about political solutions. It's not be connected. It's not necessary to be connected. It's not necessary to complicate the situation. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that's very, very clear and, and very helpful, I might say. Uh, Simon, did you want to say a few concluding remarks? Yeah, maybe just a, a few. I, I guess what, what we've all taken out of this is that this is a complex web of interactions um, of local, national, international grievances, animosity, hatred and death. And it's the the Yemenis, the ordinary Yemeni people that are paying the heaviest price for this. And that has to stop. Um, it shouldn't stop in such a way that tries to go back to a, a shell of a Yemeni state, because that will not lead to the, uh, the it will not lead to the end of, of the deaths and the, the torture and the suffering and the heartache of, of many Yemenis. Neither will a Houthi takeover of the country. So it's, it's complex. It's the it's that, that balance between figuring out the best way to stop humanitarian crisis, which may involve using force, but also not using force to such an extent that it causes future humanitarian um, crises. So it's such a such a, a complex web of interactions. But I guess the, the final thing is, and I say this as, as a, a white man living in Lancaster, but it's so important that we hear from Yemenis about these things and a plurality of Yemeni voices, but, I've seen so many events and I'm proud to say that CEPAD has never done this ever and we won't, but we have never had an event on a particular topic pertaining to the Middle East that doesn't feature uh, people from those states and uh, both um, covering not only those identities, but also genders as well. We need to hear these different voices. It's a must and panels that, that don't reflect local voices is so, so wrong. Mm. Well said, Simon. And uh, I think our discussion has been very worthwhile. As we know only too well, there are no easy answers to these complexities. But I think having discussions like this takes us a modest step forward. So thank you all very much indeed. And my thanks especially to the Foreign Policy Centre and to CPAD for facilitating this discussion. Thank you all very much indeed. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.